Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar about convenient, confident IOP for today's evolving practice with Dr. Singh. Uh, I will uh, introduce Dr. Singh just a moment from now. Tonight, we're going to talk about the changing landscape of glaucoma practice, uh, particularly in the COVID era now here. We're going to talk about the need for convenient, delegatable, and safe tonometry and we'll provide an overview of the Tanopenavia device and talk a little bit about the published evidence in the literature for its accuracy and usefulness and um, features and benefits of that product. And of course, we'll have Q&A. Just a few um, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, there are some handout materials in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. I think there's about four or five documents there that you can download and hopefully will be useful and interesting to you. Uh, if you do have a question, our preference is that you type in the question on the question panel. That makes it a little bit less chaotic than having uh, everybody's microphones open. Um, and uh, please, at the end of the webinar, take uh, one minute to um, take our webinar survey. It just ask you a few brief questions about how we did. Very helpful for us so that we can do a better job next time. My name is Dave Taylor, by the way. I'm a Director of Product Management and Business Development for Rikert Technologies. I've been with Rikert for about 20 years, heavily involved in the tonometry and glaucoma side of Rikert. Uh, and I'm really excited to introduce Paul Singh tonight. Dr. Singh is the president of the Eye Centers of Racine and Kenosha, which was founded in 1981 chief resident, and he completed his residency at Cook County Hospital, Division of Ophthalmology, and did his internship at Michael Reese Hospital, Department of Medicine. Uh, he, his undergrad was from Washington University with a BA in Biology and Psychology, and he did his fellowship at Duke University in 2004. Great place there at Duke. And he's involved with clinical research, published numerous papers and um, in several ophthalmology journals. Uh, if you have never met Dr. Singh in person, I must tell you that he is also one of the nicest and most wonderful human beings that you'll ever meet on the face of this planet. All around good guy. And in addition to that, what is most important to him is that he is a cheesehead. Uh, he is a Packers fan. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to our, our superstar guest of honor, Dr. Singh, to uh, take us through the meat of this presentation. Dr. Singh, I'll advance the slides for you, so just let me know if anything's going wrong. All right, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks for that intro. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I am a cheesehead. In fact, when I was a kid, so my parents came from India in 1967, and my mom and dad like got super intense and too involved in like the Packer world and the Green Bay Packers and you know everything cheesehead. So when I went down to St. Louis for my undergrad, my parents gave me this box and said, okay, son, when we leave, remember your roots and don't forget where you come from. So they gave me this box. I opened this box. I'm thinking maybe a new turban, a new Bible or something, right? No, they actually made me a cheese head. They actually did fit over my turban. So I never forget my roots. So I am a proud Wisconsinite, even though I live in now in Illinois, um, but I do practice out here, try to practice, do a lot of um, research. We have a full-time research uh, center as well and do a lot of glaucoma, but also cataract refractive as well. So uh, thanks for that intro, Dave. But also I'm in a band, as you probably saw in that previous picture, it keeps me sane. I think all of us need an outlet to kind of de-stress ourselves. So music has been my passion. So that's the other thing. If you ever if you ever go online, if you want to listen to some Indio, Indo-Funk Afro-Caribbean style music. It's Funka Desi, F-U-N-K-A-D-E-S-I. Check it out on YouTube. Thanks, Dave. Next slide. But I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, I've been I've been actually a lot of working on um, kind of thinking about how would I to talk about you know the ton of pen and and really efficiency and flow and what is it importance. And I think nowadays, uh, you know, I've, I've relied on the on the handheld tonometry so much more than I ever have, and I'll, we'll talk about why that is. But you know, it's, just to remind ourselves that. Glaucoma and pressure, it's all we got. <laughs> no matter how much we want to avoid worrying about pressures, it's all we got. Pressure reduction, pressure reduction, pressure reduction. So accurate, consistent, reliable measurements of IOP is just such an important part of our practice. And we're making decisions on SLT or adjunct therapies or MIGs or you know, glaucoma surgery or just to watch and observe, right, based upon how stable sometimes our IOPs are. I mean, look at studies like advanced glaucoma interventional study or SIGITS. I mean, fluctuating IOP 
it can be an independent risk factor for progression. So if something is not consistent or uh, reproducible, I think you may have a risk of having issues like that and maybe even falsely have to, you know, do surgery or procedure on someone or advanced treatment. So pressure is still our king. We got to still make sure we uh, follow up with that. But, you know, what has changed, and I'd love to hear you guys out there. I mean, to me, this, this whole world that we're living in with COVID has completely revolutionized how we do uh, and how we follow our patients. And I'd love to hear kind of any comments you guys have in the chat box there as well. But, you know, I think that we had to adjust early on I and mean, we shut down as many of you did in March, April, and really half of May. And only did we start to get involved in June and July, really getting back into the swing of things. And we had really spent all that time in March and April figuring out how do we come back online? And, you know, I think there's no doubt a lot of changes that we had because patients coming in, they all they cared about was how safe are you? Patients were also worried about missed appointments, you know, gosh, doc, I haven't had my appointment in four months. I'm advanced glaucoma. What's going to happen? So, you know, we did utilize things like telemedicine. I mean, that was a huge, a huge part of what we did. Just kind of making sure even things like blebs, hey, look at, let me see your bleb. <laughs> I was like, doesn't look red. Okay, we're good. I mean, even something as simple as that helped. But, you know, we also did it involve patients coming into clinic, you know, just getting their pressures checked, you know, kind of quickly, even if I wasn't there, my, actually I have a daughter who has a, uh, uh, autoimmune condition on, on some immunosuppressants. So I was freaked out to go to the office. So we actually had patients coming in, just getting their pressures checked by, by staff and just calling me and doing a telemedicine visit saying, hey, you know what, your pressures are fine based upon my staff's uh, pressure check and they did an OCT or whatever visual field they had to. But really, I avoided visual fields early on too, just with the OCTs if we had to. And so people did a lot of drive-through IOP checks. I know a lot of colleagues, uh, we tried that for a, few, for a few times too, and just kind of people coming in, just doing a pressure check, see you later, in and out. And, you know, patients really wanted that. There was, a, I'd love to hear your thoughts too out there, but people even now come in, if they're waiting more than like 20 minutes in, in the exam room or in the in a waiting room and there's other people there, they're, they're starting to flip out. You know, we also instituted these kind of paging systems where now patients, when they check in, they have a little pager and they go in and they're ready. They get beat to come in like, like a restaurant almost. And and that's that's been helpful, but, you know, patients don't want to stay at all as well. So something, something to think about as we kind of go along is, you know, how do we become more efficient? And I think, being more efficient was something we always realized was important to us, but now I think COVID just brought that out to the, to the open and really enhanced it and, and really made it even more of an issue as well. So I think efficiency and flow is is most important thing that we can see now. And scheduling, you know, how do we schedule appropriately? Whether it's scheduling patients where I have two doctors in the office, okay, me, I may come in at 10 o'clock now, work till eight o'clock at night. Right. So I think we're trying to work on our schedules and we're still it's kind of a work in progress, too, for us, where, you know, we had two doctors in the office. Now we're trying to limit the number of patients. So we stagger the doctor's visits, staggering our patients differently, doing a lot more diagnostic testing and then calling patients back. So we're separating the, the doctor visit with a diagnostic visit. And so if I'm in surgery, let's say patients come in, have their OCT visual field or, or uh, whatever else they have to do, and then they come back. And then I, I see them later on if I need to, or do a telemedicine visit and just talk about the results as well. So I think there's, there's no doubt a lot of changes going on. And I think for me, I'm relying so much more on my technicians. You know, that's something that I never really had to rely. I was always doing everything myself, you know, glaucoma, I want to check the applination, I want to do my gonioscopy, I want to do everything myself. And I think what COVID has kind of taught me to do is trust your technicians that they're going to they're gonna be part of this whole uh, new healthcare flow that we have. And so that's been a big, big issue as well. And I think, you know, just overall, we doing a lot more online resources. You know, we, we've done a lot of videos and I'm sure a lot of you already put videos on your websites to say, welcome back and we're back and here's what we're doing. And, and it's funny because a patient came to me and said, you know, doc, I'm not worried about how good you are. I'm worried about how safe you are. <laughs> it's like, really? I mean, people actually come in with that. And so safety is, as you see in the slide is another big issue that we're finding. And we actually spent a lot of time trying to figure out kind of what was our, our new new flow, our new SOPs or operating procedures. In fact, it was so confusing because we, we looked at all these different websites and all these different consulting firms and no one really had a consistent answer. So we figured out, you know, we'll do the best we can. And we obviously like everybody else, we do the infrared temperature checks. Uh, we ask patients, you know, have you been out anywhere travel and have you been exposed and you been sick and do all the you know usual spiel as well. We try to be as touchless, touchless as we can. We don't have them sign papers as much anymore. We have them log in at, at, at home. We have a website and a nice, nice program that allows us allows them to check in on their phone now versus having to kind of come in and physically write or sign a HIPAA form as well. So paperwork online or apps that you can have in your phones or their phones to check in and things have been really helpful. helpful. I think social distancing is probably the biggest thing we've changed. I mean, we took, oh, it looks like a ghost town in our, in our waiting room. We had a beautiful waiting room with the nice, all these nice little seats and couches together and TV. And 
And now it's like, you know, three chairs. <laughs> and so everyone's waiting in the car, waiting outside. And so then that's a big thing. Even within the office, you know, it's really important too. And patients will pay attention to the staff. If their staff is not social distancing, if they're taking off their mask for any reason and talking to other people, patients would, would call them out. And I've had some patients say, you know, your staff wasn't really as, as di diligent about social distancing. I saw them take off their mask and talk to each other. So we were really hard on our staff. Say, look, man, you got to lead by example. Patients look at you. And so that was a big thing as well. And so cleaning equipment, doing it in front of patients, really important as well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts out there. You know, what, what are you guys doing? Uh, and in terms of how your practice has changed in terms of patient safety. So I think we have, you have a poll, I think, Dave, right? Yeah, we got a poll. So I launched the poll. Everybody should see it on their screen um, and be able to uh, vote. During the right. pandemic, how have you evolved your practice to provide the safest patient care? Select all that apply. So go ahead and start clicking your vote. It says it's distributing, and here we go. The they're coming in. the The votes are coming in. All right, and, can't um, wait. Hundred percent have said they've updated their cleaning procedures in their office. Eighty percent have reduced uh, uh, patient uh, traffic. Um, Seventy-five percent have patient check-in process changes. Uh, Thirty-five percent incorporating virtual uh, visits and telemedicine, and sixteen percent have extended office hours. So that's how it shakes out. I'll close the poll now. And turn it back over to you, Dan. Now it's great. Thank you. That's really interesting. I think I think all of us are doing that. I'm curious to see how telemedicine uh, evolves. You know, I mean, it, it, we have slowed down our telemedicine visits now that we've kind of gone back to more live and you know a lot more surgeries and clinic exams. But I, I do think we still use them, even for refractive now patients. You know, like we've kind of utilized that uh, kind of methodology, just getting getting to know patients on, online first and then seeing if they're worth coming in, if they have interest as well. But thanks for that poll, guys. I appreciate that and. Uh, Love to hear more. We have a couple of polls later on too, as well. But you know, Goldmon is still our our tried and true form of IOP measurements. It's it's the gold standard. Look, as a glaucoma specialist, I, I do it every day. It's what I use. <laughs> we always will. Uh, but you know, if you think about it, there's a lot of variance. There's a lot of issues that we face with Goldmon. I mean, you know, even technician to technician sometimes. I mean, you know, patients will come in and say, "Hey, my pressure was 12 today," and they've always been like 18. And I'm like, let me double check that. <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, no, it's it's 16 or 18 a day. So, you know, I've seen even within technicians, obviously we know if there's too much fluorescein, too little fluorescein, the Myers can be thick or thin. Someone's holding their breath. I mean, I still find that as an issue for my technicians, you know, when they're holding pieces of patients holding their breath, uh, you know, pressures go up. Uh, patients sometimes have, you know, orbits that are hard to open up. They're pushing on the eye or yeah, obviously the, 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 lid, the lids can touch the Goldman applination tip and that can cause the pressure to fluctuate as well. So I, I think there's still a number of, of variances, variations that or uh, effects that can affect the IOP stability and consistency, but also cleaning. I think that's where my technicians have been really frustrated with because you know they wanna make sure that they're cleaning it and the patients wanna make sure that we're cleaning these tips appropriately as well. And, and so you know, also being so close, I mean, we have these slit lamp shields and I know that a lot of these companies have been given, which has been fantastic. But, you know, still, you're really darn close to these patients, like in their face. And, you know, I've, I had a patient, too, who's like, oh, I don't have COVID. I, I was tested about about a month ago, but I, I was, I think I was exposed, you know, before that. And all of a sudden, it goes, hachoo. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. But, you know, you know, we're all freaked out about that as well. So, you know, I think that, no doubt there's bias potential, but I think the uh, the COVID issue now is becoming apparent as well for a lot of us. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the pandemic and which method of Tonometry, have you sh shifted to handheld? Are you still using Goldman? Do you use, you know, pneumotrometry? What do you use? <clears throat> and there it is. Let's see how the audience votes. They're coming in. So 30%, 20%, 25% say they haven't changed. 13% uh, say they've changed to Goldman tonometry, but 38%, now 40%, say that they have changed to handheld tonometry. Uh, as a result of COVID. So it looks like we have the votes coming in uh, substantiating what you just talked about, Doc, that you know people are, are a little bit more hesitant to do Goldman and, and people are shifting to uh, handheld uh, tonometers right now. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, you know, look, I'm not here to say Goldman's not valuable. It is, it, we're still gonna use it. <laughs> it's, it's still gonna be the gold standard, but yeah, there are definitely a number of situations where Goldman may not be the appropriate one, but also I think with COVID too, uh, it's definitely hel helped a lot. I think the comfort level from a patient perspective, our staff for sure as well. And, and I think, you know, as we look at here, why? I mean, it is convenient. I mean, there's no doubt. And I mean, I was going to share this later on, but I had a patient literally just now about an hour ago before I finished my clinic, uh, a 
cataract uh, glaucoma consult, patient has severe Parkinson's, clearly contracted and has some dyskinesia, et cetera, from medicines. And there's just no way I could do a, a, a gold mod or even an ORR or anything else like that. I was like, I got to use a tonopen. So thank God <laughs> I had a tonopen. So there's a number of situations where it is no doubt convenient. It's lightweight. It's easy to kind of take with you and anywhere you want as well. Um, it's easy to delegate. And that's where, for me, it has uh, been really beneficial is being able to not worry about in, inter or intra um, or into rather uh, technician variability. You know, there are some techs who are better at gold mod than others. Uh, I've seen it in our clinic all the time. And so now that I'm relying on them to check pressures, let's say after intravitreal injection or after, let's say, a vitreal lysis, they do a lot of laser flow treatments, like pressures can go up with those patients. Or of course, glaucoma, for some reason, if, they, if, I, if I need them to check a pressure for me, post SLT um, somewhere else, you know, it, being able to not have to worry about, okay, is this a good technician who can do all application or not? Are they trained appropriately as well? I even had patients who complained that their eyes were scratched. And one patient came back really pissed off because she had a really bad abrasion from one of our technicians trying to check gold bonds. So with all those different issues, I think we, we do do like to have uh, the ability to use a handheld tonometry as well. And I think now too, just the distance, being able to be far away from a patient in case, uh, you know, because you're worried about them, them having any risk of COVID, I think it does help. And sanitization, you're not having to worry about sanitizing be able to change those tips of the tonal pen or a tonometer tips versus having to wash the gold mod. So with that, uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the different technologies that we have in the handheld tonometry space, right? We have in pneuma tonometry, we have now the rebound tonometry has become more popularized with eye care home as well and eye care tonometry. And then of course we have the tonal pen as well, which is like a version kind of, of application. And we'll get to kind of those two. But let's talk about rebound because there's been some, some uh, you know, excitement about this technology lately. Again, these are all good technologies and all useful. But I think you know we'll we'll look here at some data that shows that rebound, although can be great and helpful, it's not always as accurate as we think as well. It can be, I think, uh, affected by corneal thickness. It can be affected by the position on the cornea if you're not central, let's say if inferior or temporal as well. So it's it's dependent upon the operator. It can be even age dependent as well. So uh, we're going to talk about the correlation with that and GAT and even positioning and even bi biomechanical properties of the eye. That can also affect the, um, I think, the stability or the consistency of rebound technology as well. So here's just a couple of studies we'll go through that talks about the correlation between Goldman applination as well as eye care, uh, which is the rebound technology as well. Now this is a slide that shows you that you know IOP and the x-axis y is the eye care, and it's showing you the correlation to that slope here, um, that gray slope. Yes, there's pretty good correlation, but it starts at like four millimeters <laughs> of mercury, not zero. I mean, there's an offset. So in other words the eye care is really overestimating about four millimeters of mercury, the pressure compared to the uh, eye care, uh, the Perkins, which is handheld gold mod. And if you see here the plots, there's actually some variation, about 11.6 millimeters of variation or scatter uh, away from that, that gray line you see. But really, I think what was fascinating was not the extremes, but that only 53%, so about a half, were within three millimeters of mercury. So in other words, half of the patients had IOPs that differed from the Perkins handheld gold mine by more than three millimeters of mercury as well. So not only can it est overestimate the pressure in some patients, right? It can also be off four, five, six, even seven millimeters of mercury. We'll talk about in which patients that can happen to, uh, but in general, if you look at that data set, it does have some flux uh, fluctuation potential. You know, looking at CCT, and this is really an interesting study that was done. And what they looked at in this study was subtracting the IOP from rebound minus Perkins. So the IOP from the rebound tonometry minus the Perkins handheld gold bond and what that, what that value was. And then they correlated that with IOP or rather with CCT. So what you're gonna see here, as, as you see here, at, at an average, like 550 microns, pretty good correlation there. But as you go up higher, 600, 650, you start to see how much of a difference there is between the rebound and the actual applination tonometry as well. So in other words, you're seeing up to 10, 12, millimeters of mercury difference between the two as you go up in coronal thickness. So this is where we always talk about, you know, CCT and after hypertension trial, et cetera. But this is where, you know, you make it fooled with some of these patients where you may be overestimating them in general, but then you might be even over further estimating them because the coronal thickness is, is thicker as well. So you have to be realized that that coronal thickness may actually affect even more than other forms of, of, of tonometry as well. So that was a, an important slide there. Children also, by the way, nice caveat, for those of you who do pediatric ophthalmology or optometry, um, it, does, it does affect them because kids tend to have thicker corneas and we do see the same fi finding in children as well. Um, another study which is really fascinating, I'm a big fan of the ocular response analyzer. So those of you who is hysteresis know how valuable that is. It's a, it's a tool that is for me indispensable, probably the one 
factor I use to differentiate if someone's going to have uh, progression or not, or someone's going to be treated more aggressively. But that's a different lecture. <laughs> but but basically, this is a study looking at biomechanical properties. What's the eye's ability to kind of absorb and disperse energy? There's kind of the shock absorbing ability of the eye. So unlike pachymetry, which is a static number of the corneal thickness, what what hysteresis is, or or basically look at look like the the, the um, which is called a CRF. This is an older version of hysteresis, but same idea. Looking at the ability for the eye to absorb and disperse energy, and what it shows you here is that as you go higher and higher of your hysteresis or your your ability to absorb energy, you see much more fluctuation and much more scatter of the rebound IOP compared to um, Goldman. And so, in other words your hysteresis or your biomechanical properties of the cornea, not just the thickness, can influence how stable or how accurate the eye care or rebound tonometry is, which is another variable too. So not only you have pachymetry, but you also have biomechanical properties of the cornea that can affect it as well. So because of all these things, they can make a difference. Now in that same study, if you can go back one slide real quick here, in that same study, they also looked at you know, central, nasal, and temporal. So what they looked at is, okay, if you, if you do the rebound centrally, or nasal or temporal, what does that look like? And you can see there is a little difference in these lines. So between the different parts of the cornea, you might have a different level of inaccuracy, so to speak. So the next slide here goes into that a little bit more detail here. And if you can press that video up there for me, Dave, this is, shows you the reason why you may be off if you're inferior is because what is looking at is the deceleration of the probe when it hits the cornea and then rebounds back, right? Well, if you're off, the center of the apex of the cornea, it might come back and rebound in a kind of a, in a tangential fashion, right? It kind of, kind of torques down there, not straight back. And because of that, you may get a false reading. And so looking at the study here on the right, it looked at three different uh, parts of the cornea, the nasal center, which is the apex, and then the temporal part of the cornea. And they also broke it down in different age groups, less than 30, 31 to 60, and 60, which is kind of interesting too from an age perspective. But you find that there is a difference, statistical significant difference between the averages, the means uh, of the, or the ranges rather, the ranges between nasal, center, and temporal with the rebound. So it is more sensitive to where you are applying this on the cornea versus nasal, temporal, or center, which is operator dependent or even patient dependent, depending if they're uh, going to be compliant or not cooperative as well. So that's kind of a little bit about rebound tonometry because there's been a lot of noise on that. Again, still a good option, but there is some variability and, and some issues with the accuracy there compared to Goldman. So let's talk about the, the tonal pen, which I've used now, and I've used the, uh, the uh, Avia, which is their newer version, which I'm sure Dave will talk more about it as well. But this is a cool study. And this is to me what really made me feel more comfortable saying, you know what, this is actually something I can rely on. They basically took patients who were going to have a some type of vitreo retinal surgery, whether it's a macular hole, a, a epiretinal membrane removal, et cetera, vitreous hemorrhage, et cetera. And so they know they're going to go in the eye anyways there. So let's just go ahead and check in a sterile environment, check a tonopin reading, and then go ahead and check it with a probe in the eye and see what's the pressure and what's the correlation. Well, looking basically down at the bottom right there, you see there's actually no difference, no statistical difference in terms of the actual IOP between the tonopin and the measurement in the eye itself. If you look at that TIOP and ACIOP, almost it's identical between the two as well. So in other words, very, very close correlation between the two when you measure it in the eye itself versus the tonopan. These are, again, patients to 79 consecutive patients. So pretty impressive data. Uh, looking at another data set uh, out there as well, just showing us uh, correla cor correlating between the periphery of the cornea and central. Like we talk about with you know, rebound tonometry, is there a difference between central and temporal or, or peripheral? And if you see here between the gold mod and the tonopan, centrally or mid peripherally you see how in the bottom right there there is a nice correlation the scatter plot looks very close to that line there which means very tight so that's a really important differentiation so therefore i here's why this is important to me because i know my techs aren't always perfect <laughs> they're estimating this i've watched them and i love my technicians not to give them a hard time but they're not always perfectly centered in every single patient right so to know that if they're a little bit off not quite in the center a little temporal or nasal i feel much better uh, the fact that, that this might still give me a good reading. Plus, if you think about all the corneal pathologies that we have, right? Someone has band keratopathy, a pterygium, some corneal transplant, something else that's strange where you say, hey, well, I may have to go a little temporal, a little more nasal. At least you feel more comfortable that it is probably pretty darn accurate, which is good. So that's just a nice study that shows us that as well. So in a nutshell, I, mean, I kind of went through these kind of fast here, but you know, really to me, it's not about what's right or wrong, what's you know, perfect. Look, they all have their variances. There's all going to be some nuances between all the tonometry readings. But I think when you look at data, 
And you look at the new version, this is the, which is the Avia, which is really a cool technology, which you see on the right there, which really gives you within, you know, within a couple of clicks, uh, does rapid measurements. Uh, it's actually to measure the app, it measures the application, the rebound of the, uh, rather the uh, indentation of the cornea and back. With the, it does within five uh, actual measurements or 10 rebounds or applications, it can give you a reading. With a new version, which Dave is going to talk to you about, it can do it even faster. But the, what, what I love about it is that my technicians find it so much easier to use now. And they've actually used this more now for all my post vitreal injections, all my post what we call vitreal lysis patients, even people who, let's say, I need to come in post SLT, I'm somewhere else, or if there's telemedicine visits where I'm somewhere else and they're coming in and I'm going to call them back. I have them use now the Tonopen uh, or the Aura versus Goldman because I feel more comfortable now with that's consistent. But number two, I'm not worried about them irritating the cornea and causing any irritation between patients because the cornea is so dependent upon patients, whether it's thickness, the shape of the cornea, the, all those different variables as well. So I kind of use it now for so, so many patients that way. But to, per, for me personally, anybody who has difficulty putting their you know, chin in the chin rest, people have short necks. Think about how many patients have a little more robust uh, figure, have, let's say, you know, kind of no neck at all. When they go on the chin rest like this, I mean, I've seen at least three or four, sometimes five millimeters of mercury difference between patients that just tell them to sit back and relax versus even doing this. And even if I do a tone of pen like this and a tone of pen sitting back, you see about four or five millimeter mercury difference just because of the EVP, right? You're compressing, increasing episcleral venous pressure. So, and those kind of patients, it can be really, really, I think, beneficial. And then I Actually, think- got a, We got a question kind of related to that, Dr. Singh. Somebody asked if you, if you routinely or if you ever measure patients in the supine position, and I, I assume they mean intentionally rather than, you know, maybe somebody in, in a hospital bed or something. And, and if so, why? Do, why do yeah. you do that? Yeah, no, I've actually done that before. In fact, um, I'm, I don't have any great data as to support this personally. I mean, I know there's data out there showing sometimes two to four millimeters of mercury increase in pressure by putting someone in the supine position just because of the rise in EVP. Absolutely great point. But sometimes you can kind of differentiate. Is this an EVP issue potentially? So we're looking at kind of different, for instance, MIGS procedures, canaloplasties, and some of these natural conventional outflow MIGS. And so what we're trying to figure out is why are some people doing so, why do they do so much better than some others? Now, especially if you do a procedure where you're, let's say doing a GAT, where you're opening up the TM, you're having direct access to the distal channels, why do some people not have any response to some of those procedures and some do? And what we're looking at actually is that same question. Is there something with EVP? Because if you have an EVP that's higher in some patients, or that's not Sturge Weber, but someone just a straightforward POAG, we are seeing that that is potentially a rationale for why they don't do as well, even for SLT. We looked at patients who didn't do quite as well in SLT. We had them, had them lie down. We found there was an overall, we didn't have great data to publish yet, but overall, there's a little bit higher rise in EVP when you lie in, or pressure when you lie them down. So one thought is, before you do SLT even, do that test, see if they go up much pretty high. If they, if they go up much higher, maybe SLT may not have you give you the results that you want. That may be the 20% of patients who don't respond potentially as well. So yes, I think it's an option to think about, and that's the rationale why I would do that personally. Good question. Thanks for that. Um, just real quick on, on safety. Uh, I know that uh, safety is always an issue and lately. We talked about it earlier with COVID, and it's nice having these little tip covers. And I, I, change, I put it on in front of the patient. I tell my technicians, put the covers on <laughs> in front of the patient because it's just nice for them, the patients to see it. You know, they can see it, you know, you're, you're treating you're treating them, but you know, obviously it's as safe as possible. Plus something small, but I think it's just so easy to use. You press a button, the green light comes on, it's already ready to go. The, the Avia doesn't have to be, um, you know, the calibrate it, which is really good too as well. So you press one button, turns green, and you just could do a couple of shots on the, on the cornea there, and you have a nice big readout there as well. As well, it gives you a confidence interval, 95%. It tells you the kind of how good the, the reading was. So I think that does help a great deal as well. So, you know, I think for me in general, I think a ton of pen is a, if you're going to do any handheld for me personally, I think it makes the most sense. It's, it's the most universal, utilized, great data out there. And I think it's one of the easiest to use uh, in the marketplace. And I think now with kind of COVID and, and the issues that we're having with sterility uh, concerns, I think it does help having these covers to not have to worry about having to clean a tip as well. Dave, what do you think? You want to take over? I think it's awesome. I, I really appreciate you taking us through the, uh, the the clinical stuff. Those studies, you know, a lot of people think, well, tonopen has been around for a long time, and it has 35 years, you know, but there's still studies in the literature and new studies in the literature coming out that that are, are worth paying attention to. That one uh, on the manometric pressure is really impressive. I mean, uh, you know, who, who'd ever expect that you could get so close to the true intraocular pressure? Um, and, but there it is, 79 patients, really strong data. So um, I'll, I'll spare you from, from having to uh, talk about the product, even though I know you could do it. 
and I'll <laughs> I'll take over the I'll take over the next couple of slides for you. Um, good good point you made about the uh, the tip covers. I think maybe some of our audience knows that there are other brands out there that are available, competitive brands, if you will, to the tip covers. We made our tip covers blue a number of years ago, specifically to differentiate them from the knockoff brands, uh, because the other manufacturers have unknown uh, manufacturing uh, tolerances, differences in thickness and elasticity, the same sorts of things that affect the measurement of IOP because of the cornea will affect the accuracy of a tonneau pen if those material properties are different in the cover that's going over the uh, transducer uh, on the tip. So those things can make an, uh, an impact on the accuracy of the IOP. They can also affect the, the lifetime and the, and the maintenance requirements of your tonneau pen because you know latex products uh, like a latex glove, for example, these and gloves have talc inside of them. We control very, very carefully the amount of talc that goes in those, so we're not clogging up the tip of the tonneau pen that's got very uh, small clearances around the transducer. Some of the other manufacturers use too much talc in their tip covers, and it causes you to have to send in your tonneau pen for cleaning or service on a more frequent basis. And something else that may be not so apparent to people um, without thinking about it is the tonneau pen can actually save you money over time uh, even though we like to talk about things like accuracy and, pa and best patient care, but you know uh, we, uh, we have to run a business here too. Uh, versus the eye care, because the probes, the individual use probes for an eye care are somewhere between about 84 cents and even up to a dollar a piece, the tip covers for the tonneau pen are substantially lower than that, uh, all the way down to about 27 cents a piece for our uh, bulk 600 uh, package size. So over time, and this is a pretty this is a pretty moderate assumption. I don't know how many patients a day you see routinely in your practice, Dr. Singh, but it's probably more than 15, right? So um, so you know if you're if you're seeing 15 patients a day uh, for approximately seven years, which is a typical life of an of an instrument like this, you know you're going to spend an awful lot more on the probes with the eye care than you would on the tip covers with the tonneau pen. And, and this is not you know, trickery, we're not using promotional pricing, this is our regular price assumptions that, that we put into this, this cost analysis. So the probes are probably a little bit more than two times expensive than Occufilm uh, over, over the period of ownership. A lot of people might not realize this, but Reichert is, is, is very strong in tonometry, probably the, the largest uh, um, uh, total company when it comes to tonometry in the marketplace. We've been doing tonometry for over 50 years. We started off by inventing the non-contact tonometer, the air puff tonometer back in the 1960s. And now we manufacture the tonneau pen and the pneuma tonometer and the ocular response analyzer. We even make a Goldman tonometer, an applination tonometer. So, so we are a very, very, um, have a very, very strong heritage in tonometry. Tonneau pen, I think, I don't know that anyone would argue is a very, very uh, trusted and recognized brand by clinicians around the world. Uh, dozens of studies show its accuracy and repeatability. These products are engineered and assembled at our headquarters in Buffalo, New York, where, where I am. Uh, and Reichert continues to develop uh, glaucoma diagnostic technologies like the ocular response analyzer G3 with corneal hysteresis that Dr. Singh uh, mentioned earlier. So we're really connected to the pressure measurement and glaucoma community at Reichert. Um, many of you are familiar with the Tonneau Pen XL. This is the original Tonneau Pen model that was around for a long, long time, still available for sale, but we introduced the Avia in 2008. It was the first major change to the Tonneau Pen in that long history. And a lot of people, Dr. Singh referred to it, said calibration a few minutes ago, don't like the older model because it requires a daily calibration. This is particularly cumbersome in the emergency rooms. You know, a lot of people use tonneau pens in emergency rooms, and those folks don't, don't have to measure pressure very often. And so um, you know, a patient comes in on a gurney with head trauma and they want to measure their IOP to, to, as a surrogate for intracranial pressure, and they pick up the tonneau pen and it says Cal on the screen, and they say, oh, geez, what do I do now? Uh, so the old tonneau pen, you had to go through that routine uh, at least once a day when you used it. With the Avia, you don't have to do that. As Dr. Singh mentioned, you tap a button, the light turns green, it's done a system check and it's ready to go. That's one of the nice advancements of the newer version of the device. You know, the old one, it was developed in 1985, believe it or not. So, you know, look at the size of the LCD screen. 
Uh, if you're starting to become a little presbyopic like I am, you might not even be able to see that without putting your readers on. So the, the Avia has a dual screen, one on each side. They're nice and big, easy to see for you, for your technicians. Um, we actually won two design awards for this, a Medical Device Design Excellence Award and an Excellence in Design Gold Award when we launched this product. And we, we did a really nice job on the industrial design ergonomically. Uh, almost everybody that uses this product prefers just the way it feels in your hand with these soft anti-slip grip zones and everything uh, versus the XL. The battery lasts at least four times longer. Uh, it's really hard to say because battery life is a complicated thing to measure because it depends on time and use, uh, but, but the, the battery lasts a lot longer than the batteries on the Excel did and sells for approximately the same price as the Excel batteries did. Um, and we have something new, Dr. Singh referred to it before, called the Quick Tap. We just introduced that towards the end of 2018. I want to tell you about that a little bit in one more slide. Some of the other advantages of the Avia are one button operation, really easy to, to use. There's no confusion about what to do. Again, the no calibration thing, lots of publications on, on accuracy. Uh, it is less influenced by corneal properties like thickness, um, biomechanics and, and centration on the cornea than, than I care, and even Goldman, according to some of those studies. And you can use it in any position, including supine. Something that some folks might not be uh, aware of in the United States, uh, an instrument like this might qualify for an ADA tax credit. If you can demonstrate that one of the reasons you're purchasing this device is so that you can measure patients like the one Dr. Singh described earlier that can't get into the chair, you probably can apply for an ADA tax credit uh, because you have this problem uh, in your practice. So the quick tap, this is really a neat thing. And this came directly from, from user feedback. You know, Hopefully we get back to shows like Askers and the AAO and the American Glaucoma Society meeting. And when we're there, our customers come up to the booth, doctors come up to the booth and they tell us what they like, they tell us what they dislike. One of the things they didn't like about the Avia originally was that you had to make too many taps to get a reading. And we did that because we wanted to make sure that we're giving you the right answer. You know, with the older version with the XL, unfortunately, even though it wanted you to tap the cornea four times to get a measurement, a lot of people would just take one quick tap, you get a number on the screen and they would write that down in the charts. And unfortunately that might not be the right answer because we haven't acquired enough data. So with the Avia, we force you to tap the cornea approximately five times to average 10 applanation values. You get an in and an out flexing of the cornea with each tap and we can average all of that data. But sometimes that just took too long and for certain patients, you know, pediatrics or patients that are just immediately post-op that you're trying to figure out if the pressure's 20 or 60, um, you know, you just don't want to be tapping the cornea that often. So, so we listened to the customers and, and we created this quick tap mode. And with the quick tap, what happens is you get a measurement every time you touch the cornea. So if you really just need a quick and dirty, you will get a number with one tap of the cornea. Uh, but you, but the, the, the LED on the device now will change colors depending on the reliability of the measurement based on the standard deviation of the, of the data it's obtaining. So you can get a green light, which means high confidence reading in as few as two taps if, if, uh, if you get good, clean quality uh, IOP data from a proper tap of the cornea. So this is great. You can get good quality measurements in, in mu much less time, fewer taps, easier for your techs, more patient friendly, uh, and, and, the, and the green light, yellow light system is really easy for people to understand. We've, we've had great, um, feedback from our customers with this so far. As a matter of fact, Dr. Singh was one of the people that helped uh, beta test this for us at his practice before we launched the, the product a couple of years ago. Awesome. Definitely helpful, <laughs> no doubt. One of, the, uh, one of the other things that we can do is we can do a virtual demo. And this is something that COVID has kind of driven, you know, like all you folks out there do practicing medicine, uh, we had to figure out how to get in touch with our people too. And, and we've been doing it virtually. So this is a wonderful thing that we have now where if you want to see one of our products, we have clinical application specialists and salespeople that can take you through a quick demo at a time that's convenient for you. So if you're interested in doing this, you know, we can teach you how to distinguish between uh, Tonopen uh, brand tonometers and other manufacturers tonometers, teach you the benefits of the tip covers, not only uh, the, you know, the authentic Riker Ocufilm blue tip covers, but also the proper application of a tip cover. If they're too tight or if they're too loose, that can affect the accuracy and the ease of use of the instruments. 
um, we can um, in, inform you of whatever our current promotional offers are too when we do one of these live virtual demos with you. So if you're interested in that, reach out to us and we would be really happy to set one up for you. So in summary, um, I, think, I think we would all agree that it's uh, more important than ever to have instruments that help keep your practice safe um, and while providing essential care. And I think that's really important. You know, I've been on some other webinars about safety during COVID and I've actually heard a couple of speakers say that IOP is optional at this point in time, that maybe, you know, you shouldn't uh, measure the pressure right now because of concerns about COVID and tear film. Actually, I think the literature shows that those concerns are, are really exaggerated. That there's a pretty low probability of, of COVID being in the, in the tear film. Um, but I don't think IOP is optional. This is, a, as Dr. Singh described early in the presentation, a really important metric for our patients that need to be monitored over, over time, especially in suspects and glaucoma patients. And products like Tonopen um, can help you do it safely uh, now and into the future, especially when you combine it with our, our single-use sanitized Ocufilm tip covers, uh, really, really reduce or eliminate the uh, probability of cross-contamination. And another point about the tonal pen, we've recently expanded our cleaning instructions. So it used to be that we recommended wiping the body of the instrument off only with isopropyl alcohol. We know that people are using things like bleach wipes and PDI and whatnot. So if you visit our website, we have a cleaning section that, that we're updating rapidly because we're doing a lot of testing right now with our products. And we have expanded the number of products that we recommend for you to wipe down your tonal pen wet with. But that being said, this product does not require high level disinfection because nothing reusable touches the cornea. That's the magic of the disposable tip cover. You only need to wipe down the body of the instrument with uh, something like a PDI or an isopropyl wipe after you've used it. Um, so I think uh, we, we have a, another couple of questions that came in. Somebody asked about ordering some things. We'll, we'll respond to that after the presentation. And somebody said, um, um, some of the doctors in my market are, are opposed to um, the NCT, okay, so talking about air puff tonometry, yet they're fine with Tonopen. Um, do you have any comments on that, Dr. Singh? I could probably come up with a couple, but I was interested in what your response to that would be. I mean, differences between Tonopens and non-contact tonometers and variability and people's opinions about which is the right one to use. Yeah, I mean, that's a great that's a great question. I mean, there's no doubt that there's people, the benefits of a non-contact is you're not touching the cornea at all. So if you don't want to actually have any, any I need to touch up the cornea, it's nice to have that. But there's been this older technologies of, of, of noatonometry were not quite as accurate. I know the Aura and some other ones are much more accurate. I know Dave can talk about that. But um, but I think that the, the tonal pen that the, 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 what we have now with the Avia is, is really accurate. And I feel, look, at the end of the day, if you're trying to figure out are you want to switch your whole clinic to this and not use Goldmon at all? Or is this more, I'm gonna, I want to use something else in case I can't do Goldmon? To me, this is, for me, a far better way. It's mobile, it's easy to use, easy to take to different rooms. Uh, and I think it's very reliable and consistent. So to me, the tone of pen, if you look at data, is pretty darn accurate. I and mean, at the end of the day, too, again, not to say that we shouldn't worry about any kind of fluctuation or disparities, but we're trying to also look for ranges. When I tell a patient, I want your pressures in a range, middle teens, upper teens, lower teens, this will give you within a millimeter or two of the Goldman, of the Goldman where you're at. So for me, I'd rather have that than try to force a Goldman on someone where I'm not going to get the best measurement, get the tech, I can't do it, or me having a hard time keeping an eye open, a patient's not cooperative, the tonal pen really does help a lot. So I think from all, all those reasons, I do prefer that for the tonal pen. How about you, Dave? What are your thoughts? Yeah, you you touched on a few really important points there, especially when you said older technology. You know, when, when whenever we have a customer call our office or visit us at the trade show booth and say, my tonometer X is inaccurate, what's the cause? I always say, well, it's time to put our detective hat on now and drill down into what's going on here because there's so many variables that can affect the accuracy and repeatability of all of these instruments. As you mentioned, an older uh, air puff tonometer, even the ones that we manufactured uh, 10 to 12 years ago, aren't as ac anywhere near as accurate as, as the um, ocular response analyzer and the 7CR that we produce today, just because of the advancements that we've made in measuring things like biomechanics and increasing the repeatability of those. Same thing goes for tonal pen. You know, the old older tonal pens that were made 20 years ago and whatnot, first of all, not only are they getting older and, and maybe need some service, but there's been improvements over time to things like the way we analyze the signal uh, to, and the way we, we average the results to make sure that, you're, that we're getting rid of outliers and so forth. So anytime anybody asks about 
variability or which one's more accurate, especially if they're saying, I have one that does this. It's really important to understand, is the instrument in good service? Are you using the correct tip covers for, you know, with, with a specific reference to the tonneau pen? Um, you know, how old is it? Has it been clean, calibrated, those sorts of things? Because all these devices are designed to read like a Goldman on average, and they all have to pass FDA, right? So, so they shouldn't be dramatically off from each other. Of course, there's things like corneal thickness that can affect eye care more maybe than tonneau pen or eye care more than Goldman. And of course, the ocular response analyzer takes care of that. Tonneau pen does a good job with corneal centration, but all these things make it to the market. So they shouldn't be wildly off from one another. So if you have a tonometer that is consistently understating one of your other tonometers or reading highly variable compared to one of your other tonometers, contact the manufacturer. If it's us, we'd love to talk to you and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. Um, I think that is it, uh, unless you have any closing comments, Dr. Singh. No, just want to say it was awesome to hang out with you, Dave. And, and thanks to everybody out there for, for spending time tonight. Hopefully this was informative uh, for you. You can keep in touch with me if you have any comments you want. To, I can give you my email address. Uh, I give it to a lot of people. It's the letter I, letter P is in Paul, S-I-N-G-H at amazing. That's A-M-A-Z-I-N-G. E Y E. So I P C and amazing I.com. Keep in touch, be safe and healthy. And uh, thanks a lot. It's a lot of fun. We did, we did get one more question that I'll answer here that just came in. Are there latex free tip covers? That's been a question that's been asked for many years. Unfortunately, no. Latex is a magical material. It's, it's ability to be manufactured with the thickness that we need and the flexibility that we need to give us the IOP measurements that we need, and especially to be backwards compatible with all the existing tonneau pens in the marketplace. We've, and also to produce a tip cover that um, has a shelf life. We have a three-year shelf life on these tip covers. Other rubber compounds tend to break down um, more frequently. And also some other rubber compounds, in order to get them to have a three-year shelf life, they need to have preservatives put into them, which also can cause allergic responses and things of that nature. So we've never been able to, to find a material that works um, that is latex-free. But the good news is um, latex is a skin allergy, and, there, and and it doesn't affect the cornea that way. So the technicians, if they have a if they have a latex allergy, probably want to wear like a nitrile glove or something like that when they're handling the Ocufilm. But the chances of it actually affecting a patient with contact with the cornea are slim to none. I agree with that, Dr. Singh? Exactly. I was just about to say, yeah, because of the cornea is different than skin allergies, so d different uh, immune response. So that's a good point to be made. But I also want to say one thing. You mentioned earlier, and you know, one of the reasons why there might be some variation or variability on your IOP measurements with your tonneau pen is what you mentioned earlier about the film cover, if it's too tight or too loose. And I, mean, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but it's important to realize that these are meant to have a certain elasticity to it. So you want to have it loose enough where you have these kind of little folds, these little, these little kind of pleats, so to speak. Yep. If they're really, really tight, where you see like the tip, the application tip of the actual probe, uh, really you can see it very clearly. That's too tight. It may, it may over, over, um, over read. Or if it's too loose, where it's just really, just know those pleats is very loose, you may underestimate. So that, that's one of the reasons why there might be some variability rather than the actual technology not working well. Yeah, and you can see it here in the picture. The way Dr. Singh described it is spot on. You can see a couple of small pleats around the tip, so you can tell it's not stretched thin. It's not so tight that you can see the, you know, the the shape of the of the transducer tip in the Ocufilm, but it's also not baggy hanging off the end where you're going to get a wrinkle in the way of the transducer. This is the, and if you use the cardboard applicator of the tip cover properly, you know, it should be very, very easy to put it on like this and make sure it's applied properly. And again, if you ever need some help with that, we can do a virtual training session with you or with your staff to make sure that you're putting these things on properly for accurate and easy readings. So I think that's it. We, um, when we close the session down here, you'll get invited to take a real quick survey. We'd sure appreciate it if you would do that. It helps us to understand what you like, what you didn't like. If there were any questions that uh, that we didn't get to for some reason, we will respond to you via email afterwards. We have all your contact information. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we really look forward to seeing you uh, at industry meetings and so forth when those sorts of things resume in the near future. Everybody, please stay safe, take care, and we'll see you then. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Dr. Singh. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Dave.